Good evening, everybody, and welcome to another exciting night of NBA basketball. With the first pick, the Detroit Pistons select Cade Cunningham from Oklahoma State University. Did Chandler again? Oh, what a block by Max Seal! My goodness! The Pistons are digging in. They got the depth. They got the big men. They got the better basketball team. No doubt about it. There's Jaden playing the passing lane. Sky's a jam. Dunked and the crowd loves it. Pistons need a three and they have just under three seconds to do it. Here's Chauncey Phillips. Here it is. He's got it. He's got it. Chauncey Phillips hits the three. Overtime. Amazing. Out of bounds. Detroit Basketball. Pistons fans, welcome back to another edition of the Palace of Pistons podcast part of the Believe Network. I'm your host, Mike Ingvalano. Joining me this week in video form, if Tim edits it, Jasper Apollonia. And, oh, yeah, by the way, the editor. He's replaced Aaron Johnson for this week. We have Tim Forkin. Tim, welcome to the pod officially. Yeah, thank you. I I have been on the podcast before, once with Aaron and then once with you, Mike. Uh, And I can't can't give Aaron any crap for for not inviting me on because... uh, He's given me this opportunity, and uh, we've done it before. Last time I was on a pod with you, uh, it got deleted. So I will reserve any uh, <laughs> angst for Aaron not being here uh, and be grateful. It is Thanksgiving. I'll be grateful that I get to take his place. Yeah. Uh, hey, at, at least what, for once, if something goes bad, Tim, you can't blame the editor for this one. So mm-hmm. he's he's off the podcast for this week. But it's great to have you here. And gosh, we have just so many exciting things to talk about, don't we, with the Detroit Pistons? It's been quite an eventful week, has it not? It's been an eventful week, yes. And Tim, I'm thankful that hopefully this will put an end to my losing the audio from the podcast, I think now a year and a half ago. (laughs) Hopefully this uh, is able to officially move us on to being able to forgive and forget. So, um Yes, we do have some things to talk about with the Pistons, but before we get into that, I would like to thank our sponsor for this week's show, and that is Bet Online. The holiday season is off and rolling. The NFL is in full stride. The NBA and NHL are in mid-season form. Bet Online is your number one destination for all your sports wagering info with up-to-the-minute sports wagering news, odds, trends, and predictions. Bet Online is the top spot for everything pro and amateur sports, and not just the big four. Bet online has info available at your fingertips with both desktop and mobile access at any time for almost any sport that is played from MMA to international soccer. Head on over to bet online today and remember to use our promo code believe B L E A V for your 50% welcome bonus on your first deposit. When you use bet online again, that's B L E A V for a 50% welcome bonus on your first deposit. When you use bet online bet online where the game starts. You're probably pretty thankful if you bet on the Pistons to cover last night. Huh? <laughs> that's that's yeah, what I'd be thankful you are. for. Yeah. You're not thankful if you decided to take the over on 27 and a half or whatever it was for wins for the season. Um, not at all. Which, if you did that, blessings to you. Um, we have a lot to talk about. But I think we should start with the sort of like 66% positive news, and that is the Pistons late at like 3.30 this afternoon um, provided an update for three key players in the rotation, Bojan Bogdanovic, Jalen Duran, and Monty Morris. So Bogdanovic has been cleared for full contact. He's expected to practice in a few days. Hasn't played in a regular season game yet, but he was the top scorer on the Pistons last year. Duran is expected back in the next couple of days. He matters a lot on the defense. Um, the defense is 7.9 points per 100 possessions better with him on the floor versus off per cleaning the glass. Makes a big difference on the interior. Maybe we'll just leave the Monty Morris thing for after we talk about the positive, but having Bogdanovich back and having Jalen Duran back, hopefully within the next couple of days. Um, Tim, I'll let you go first since you get, since, since you are our guest of guests, um, bringing Bogey back, bringing Duran back. Um, you know, the front office has harped a lot um, throughout the off season and throughout the early parts of this year that, 
they need growth. They need to get guys healthy and they need growth and just camaraderie. So what's, what's your feelings on getting Bogdanovich back in fold and then getting Duran back uh, probably shortly thereafter, if not sooner? Yeah, I'll use some, some in-person scouting experience here uh, to give my thoughts on Bogey being back. I uh, moved to downtown Detroit this summer, been able to go to almost every home game. I was in the building for the Hawks game and the Nuggets game last night. And those two specifically like stick in my mind when I think about Bogey because we're playing against these teams. The Hawks have DeAndre Hunter, um, Sadiq Bey, uh, Jalen Johnson. They just have a whole bevy of wings, uh, their own Bogdanovich that can shoot and space the floor and attack the rim and be creative. And they're just wing size players. Last night, the Nuggets beat the Pistons with a bunch of wing size players and then Reggie Jackson of all, of all point guards. So having bogey back, having another guy in the fold, and we didn't mention Isaiah Livers, who is also back and is a wing size player who can shoot. Um, I'm going to keep saying it like players like that compound for the offense. And we'll, I'm sure we have lots to talk about with Cade and the rest of the roster later, but everyone's job gets easier when a guy like Bogdanovich is out on there, out, out on the floor. And I just, I can't stress enough how helpful he should be if he is as healthy as they're saying he is, right? We, we do have some right to question how healthy Bogdanovich may be considering other things that uh, uh, are interesting for reasons obvious to some, but uh, Bogdanovich helping the team uh, it, it just has to happen, has to happen soon. And uh, hopefully these few days are actually a few days that he will be uh, waiting to play on the Pistons. Yeah, I think that's a good point you just brought up at the end there, Tim, because it's like we are assuming that that is the case. Uh, but the fact is we heard nothing about this Bogdanovich injury all summer uh, until the season was about to ramp up. And they said, oh, he's out for six to eight weeks. Uh, well, that six to eight week window passed, I believe, two, three weeks ago. Uh, it, there's no indication that this injury was picked up during the summer either. So for all we know, it was the one that he missed all that time last year with as well. Uh, it's just you're you're at the point now where you're just praying for him to come back and give you anything on the wing. And it's for the exact reasons you just said, Tim, you need NBA wings to win straight up that is how the league works guards drive your offense but you win with having good wing players and last night was a perfect example of that where reggie jackson who is a, a, i mean still at this point a, a borderline starting point guard in the league but extremely flawed where he and contavious caldwell pope and christian brown were able to in the second half more than just match the pistons output they beat them they beat them in the second half, and it was just incredibly disheartening to see, you know, Contavious Caldwell Pope with like a 30% uses percentage just ripping apart the Pistons defense, just shredding them, and having no answer for that on the other side, other than feeding Cade Cunningham more and more plays. He had like a 35% usage rate in the second half. They were just I mean, that's been the whole story for the whole season. Cade Cunningham just riding him until the wheels fall off. And the Pistons have had basically no other answers. There's been other guys in the roster, in the rotation, who we were hoping for that from. I think of Jaden Ivey. But then you look at how they're used. And, I mean, look, Jaden Ivey took two shots total in the second half. He made a layup, and he got fouled on the other one. That is it. That's all he did. So... When you have a situation like that, and when Alec Burks is not shooting well, it just reminds you exactly of how crucial Boyan Bogdanovich is to this team. Not winning games, because I think we're past that at this point. You lose 12 straight games, Boyan Bogdanovich is not the answer. Like, Boyan Bogdanovich is not winning you six more games in this 12-game span, in my opinion. But at least he can drag you to competency, to relevancy, Last night was a night, I think, especially where you needed him because, I mean, just the that, that game was so winnable, so winnable. And they couldn't do it because at the end of the game, they run out of answers. They don't have guys who can create their own offense. And you're stuck running Cade into the teeth of the defense, hoping for a dump off for Isaiah Stewart, who can barely jump over a piece of paper. So, uh, yeah, you need Bogdanovich back. You need him back badly. Morris, 
should we get into that now even? Because that seems to be potentially an even bigger story, doesn't it, Mike? Yeah, it does. And um, I wanted to get the positive stuff out of the way before we talk about Monty Morris. So I think we just did. (laughs) We may have. Um, Monty Morris received a PRP injection. He's going to be reevaluated. I think he said they re- he received it the seventeenth, so he's going to be reevaluated in six to eight weeks. Or did he? Or will he? Or did he? Yes, we had a curveball thrown in late where he tweeted out, um, and then quickly deleted Cap at that six to eight week sort of uh, injury announcement, which. That doesn't even mean he's going to be back on the court in six to eight weeks. That means he's going to be reevaluated in six to eight weeks. It could be another month after that of ramping him up to game speed. Um, yeah, that's problematic. Um, Jasper, as you've said on the pod, you know Monty Morris could be a viable candidate to play next to Cade to allow him to go off ball to be a competent passer. Um, he does not turn the ball over. The Pistons are dead last in turnovers per game. Um, So having a guy like him healthy would be nice to stabilize the offense when things get a little bit antsy, when all the kids are out there having a good time and not exactly leading to good offense. Um, So you wanted to get into Morris and then you stopped. So why don't you go ahead and continue your thought about Monty Morris being out for, you know, two months at this point and probably most definitely longer than that as he ramps back in game shape. I I honestly, I'm going to say, I think Tim should take this first because I, I have a lot to say on this issue, and I, I don't want to dominate Tim's time on here. Yeah, we're recording on, on Riverside instead of Zoom this time, and I should have queued up like the Nas Ether beat uh, for Jasper <laughs> to, to go crazy with. Because, um, yeah, it the Pistons, uh, I'm younger than both of you guys, but for as long as I've been a Pistons fan, there's there's always been some questionable injury reporting or um, evaluating or reevaluating. Um, the players the Pistons have acquired have tended to be injury prone. Um, and it never has really felt like we've gotten the full, like we've heard a lot about, Oh, just wait till this team gets healthy. And it's been years of waiting until this team gets healthy. Um, when Kate is out, uh, you don't, you have a whole season of not of waiting until you have a whole season of waiting until the team is healthy. Uh, we come into the season this year with six or seven guys on the injury report. Uh, it, there's often more guys on the Pistons injury report than the Lions, um, which is a, another story in itself. And Monty Morris immediately dropping cap on the timeline and uh, the Pistons PR Grim Reapers coming in to swipe it down um, just is fully indicative of where, I mean, this is the Monty Morris injury is a microcosm for the entire Piston season right now. Um, and I know Jasper is, is stewing to go on this, but my general take on on this Monty Morris thing is, uh, if you were writing a script of the Piston season, and we're we're speaking with some malaise here, some kind of like exhaustion, some uh, a little bit lower tone than some some episodes that I've listened to you guys go on, but I mean, this is this Monty Morris thing is just it just shows how normal Pistons fans and journalists and reporters and people are feeling about the way the this team is operating and is covered. Um, so Jasper, I'll let you take it. Yeah. I, I think it's more than just a microcosm of like where the Pistons, are. I think it's a microcosm of the organization as a whole at this point. Um, there is just absolutely zero accountability from anybody. And the, the way that they operate in terms of the injuries and the way that, you know, players and the, the front office are talking to fa- they, it, I, I'm tired of being talked down to. Like I, the more I look at that Troy Weaver apology letter from last year, the more it's it's like spitting in my face because there's just absolutely been no impetus. There's been absolutely nothing from this last off season that has shown me that any of that was legitimate. Um, let you you talked about you know the history of injuries and it goes back to before when Troy Weaver was in, in charge of this organization. We were saying that for years with Reggie Jackson and Blake Griffin and all that stuff. Here's here's just some injuries since Troy Weaver took over. Boyan Bogdanovich, 59 games last year. Hasn't appeared yet this year. Already passed his original expected recovery date. Monty Morris, 
injured to start the year. Setback, out for another six to eight weeks. Joe Harris, hurt before they acquired him. Now he's out again. Isaiah Livers, hurt to start the year. Never played in more than 52 games in his three-year NBA career. Killian Hayes, hurt his rookie year. Played 66 games his second year. Already missing games due to injury this year. Cade Cunningham, out all of last year. Came in, who knew, nobody, that he actually already had a leg injury before he was even drafted. Uh, Jalen Duran, 15 games last year he missed. Seven games this year. All ankle issues. Alec Burks, injured this year. 51 games last year. Jeremy Grant missed 28 games his first year, 35 games his second year. Kelly Olynyk missed 42 games. Marvin Bagley missed 40 games last year. 40 games last year. It, it's, it's mind-boggling. Every single piece that the Pistons bring in, and, and some of those are in quotes, because really, I mean, how much were Marvin Bagley and Kelly Olynyk contributing to winning for this roster? How much are you really expecting from Joe Harris this year? I mean, truly, let's let's really ask ourselves. If you watched Brooklyn last year, he was terrible. He was terrible. Couldn't play. And he still can't play this year. And you're bringing in these players that have had injury concerns in the past. And now they continue to get injured and they get worse. They get worse when they're on their road to recovery. Monty Morris is having setbacks in his recovery. Isaiah Livers had setbacks in his recovery. You, you have to question, one, what is the thought process between by him bringing these guys in? And two, what is, what is going on with this medical staff? And why is there absolutely no reporting, independent reporting on it too. And I'm sorry, I like a lot of Pistons beat writers. Most of them follow me on Twitter. So I don't want to be mean to them as people. But this is, again, a microcosm of how this organization runs itself. It is so insular. There is absolutely no way for reporters to report on anything because everybody is is like this within the organization. Everybody does little favors. They're all in each other's pockets. I mean, you you just look at like the Pistons second round picks, Davida Servitas, that right there, that should have been the number one sign that something was up because that draft pick, that draft pick was a favor. It was a favor by Arn Tellum and we all know it. And now this guy's back in Lithuania shooting 34% from three. You drafted him when there was other players on the board because you wanted to do something nice for a guy that helped you out in the past. And that's why I, I ge genuinely think that Pistons B reporters have very, very little ability to get anything from this, from this, this organization that isn't directly fed to them by the front office because it's so insular. There's no accountability. Everybody's friends with each other. Everyone's got their backs. And it all starts at the top with Tom Gorris, who is just – throwing money around willy-nilly, giving SVG GM and head coaching duties, and then making him trade for Blake Griffin in order to save his job. And then you turn around and you look at get, bringing Troy Weaver and you say, oh, well, we can't be good. We had no assets. Why not? Who's that start with? The guy up at the top. And, and there's just... See you out. You, you give him this huge deal... The guy doesn't even look like he wants to be here. The coaching in the fourth quarter last night was complete malpractice. Complete malpractice. What was he doing? I, I just have absolutely no idea whatsoever. He looks completely unenthused with his job. Aaron Johnson, poor guy, got his quote tweets blown up because he goes, hey, we got jammed up when uh, we got jammed up when, when, when they went small. What do you mean you got jammed up because they went... They lost Nikola Jokic, and you couldn't figure something out there? Why is that? Is it because you're an incompetent coach, or is it because you have a roster set up by a GM that's had four years to put together anything resembling competency and is completely whiffed on his draft picks, on his trades, and on his free agent signings? And there is absolutely no sign that it's going to get better anytime soon because you don't have anybody on the roster to trade. The one guy that you maybe could, and Boyan Bogdanovich, he's out. So I, I, anyway, I, I I could keep going, but 
you guys need to say something in order to, to get me off of this because I'm just incensed. Last night's game broke something in me. It really did. It was worse than the 40-point loss to the Raptors. It was. We we made it a point not to listen to the Mike Valeni 12-minute uh, 97-1 ripping of the Pistons, and I'll be very interested to see uh, what parts he went to in your in your rant right there, and like if you topped him at any point, or if he topped you? Because <laughs> I mean, you like that was an impassioned radio host. Uh, Tim rant. Mike it was perfect. Mike, they owe more second round picks over the next three drafts than they owe. <laughs> they do. It's true. They do. When I was writing, oh, and by the way, was... they they still can't trade their first round picks for the next two drafts because they owe it to the Knicks. So they have to, they have to just give a top thirteen pick to the Knicks, or they can't make any trades with first rounders. Great asset management. Hey, but at least they got expiring salaries. And that trade, just for everyone at home, that was the Isaiah Stewart trade. Um, Isaiah Stewart, uh, good, okay, Piston. You know, it was like the it was trade. It was the Duran trade to be, I believe. Uh, I, I think it was the 2020 uh, we had traded uh, the Trevor Ariza and um, our future first for that was with uh, the Rockets. Yep. Yep. We oh, traded, you're right. You're right. We traded Trevor Sorry. Ariza and our future first uh, to put our future first in jail until 2027 or 2028, I believe um, uh, for Isaiah Stewart, who as much as you like Isaiah Stewart, I think I'm going to like the players drafted after him pretty much consistently from 2021, obviously with Cade all the way through 2027, because right now it's not apparent how they get out of this besides them eventually converting to second round picks and us fulfilling the deal by never giving the Rockets a first round pick or now because that tricks that picks been traded so many times, the Knicks uh, a first round pick. Mike, could you remember when we, the Sadiq Bay for James Wiseman deal happened and we were like, I think I'd rather have the five second round picks. Is that even close to a question now? Did you watch no. James Wiseman last night? That was, I very rarely in my life had felt f- like genuine embarrassment watching somebody play basketball as a professional. That was, I, I he seems like a nice guy. Like, I almost don't even want to say anything because I, it, he's got to be embarrassed. He's got to be, like, embarrassed. I I can't imagine anything I can say would make him feel worse than he should already be feeling. (laughs) Because, oh, my God. Oh, my God. And what the hell was Monty Williams doing throwing him out there for three minutes and 20 seconds in the second half at all? Should have been over. Should not have seen the floor for a second of that second half. That was some of the worst basketball on an individual level I've ever seen. I mean, he tried to set a screen when somebody passed the ball to him. I've never seen that. Never seen that in my life. The <laughs> ball's coming at him, and he puts his hands like this. The problem with the Sadiq Bay tr- trade at the time, and I remember us talking about it, was we didn't understand why, especially for Wiseman. There just didn't seem to be any rhyme or reason as to why they did that other than let's take a flyer on a big guy who was really highly recruited and might have something in the tank but it didn't make sense because you already had duran who is that sort of blue chip center and you paid marvin bagley 12 and a half million in the off season as well don't forget yeah, that mike that's the other thing and then they doubled down and also paid isaiah stewart so well the, city... be the death of troy weaver the Sadiq Bay part of it is also like we traded him because he was going to want a $20 million extension, $20 million a year, $25 million extension. Sadiq Bay, I think all three of us can agree. We saw him up close and personal, not worth $20, $25 million a year. He's a wing who can shoot. So he actually might end up getting that. He didn't get an extension, but he, some team is going to need shooting and need play on the wing. And they're going to give Sadiq Bay that money. And, the Pistons could have had. Oh, what do the Pistons need? They need def- he's not the greatest, greatest defender, but they need shooting on the wing. They need size on the wing. Oh wow, it's almost like we had a guy who, as shooting and size on the wing, could play some some post. Like he he was a wing who could play in the NBA. Right? Nobody's doubting Sadiq Bay is not going to be a 
10 year vet, just making threes on bad teams. He could have been on our bad team, but no, he wanted, they would have had to pay him and he wasn't in the plans. So let's get something for him. Okay. Let's get a seven foot center who showed nothing on the best team in the league. Okay. Oh yeah. Their offense is pretty difficult to learn. He's got to play really fast. They don't have patience. Fine. Let that be someone else's problem. The Warriors would have had to pay a luxury tax bill that was like $49 million more or something like that by keeping him on the books. Oh, you know what? What did we say earlier? It's a favor. Ah, let's let's help them out. Let's help out the Warriors. They've had such a tough time of it the last decade, haven't Ugh. they? Let's do them a little favor. I'm sure they'll repay it sometime down the road. Hey, maybe we can, uh, I don't know, offload Stanley Amude for Brandon Podcast while we're at it. And, and and even more so with the Sadiq deal, I think it just goes to show exactly how the opposite of savvy Troy Weaver is, because he traded Sadiq at the very lowest point of his value while still having him under contract at a rookie deal for another year, knowing that he'd need shooting, knowing that he'd need size on the wing. A guy who would absolutely have rehabilitated his trade value this year with Detroit and Sadiq Bey because he'd play a huge role for this team. They would need him. And guess what? Now that he has Cade Cunningham, Jaden Ivey, Jalen Duran, hey, there might actually have been some space for him to shoot. He could have actually operated. You have a great cutter in Asar Thompson. You could have worked those guys at the three and the four. Had a really nice athletic front court that could score inside and out. Ah, well, had to get James Wiseman, I guess. Had to do another favor. So this is a good, this discussion is a good segue into our one of our other topics, which is panic trade slash make a trade slash consolidate and figure out what you're going to do with some of these assets. And just to go back to the Pistons first round pick, if it's one through 18, they're good. 19 through 30, it goes to New York. One through 13 next year, it sticks. Otherwise it goes to the Knicks. One through 11 in 2026, Otherwise, it goes to the Knicks. And then 1 through 9 in 2027, uh, 10 through 30 go to the New York Knicks. And I think after that, it's two seconds, if I'm not mistaken. Yep. Um, so they really don't have control over first rounder until tw- the 2028 draft, uh, which sucks, to put it lightly. It really inhibits the ability. Like when you get to 2027, 2028, God forbid that pick doesn't already convey, and you're stuck sort of being handicapped even if the core is at its let's compete right now, we're ready to win right now. You don't have a first round pick to sort of move in a trade to insulate that core with another vet to put yourself in a better position to do well in in the, in in the playoffs. So Zach Levine's come up in trade talk as a guy that would like to no longer be with the woeful Chicago bulls. Jasper, Jasper has his head in his hands already. (laughs) <laughs> now i remember i don't remember who i was debating on palace pistons but i was debating somebody who said that the blake griffin trade was a win and i said it is not a win it is the opposite of a win and i'm getting real blake griffin trade vibes if the pistons decide to break the glass and hit the giant emergency red button and put together a trade for zach levine a floor raiser immediately yes a $49 million player option in 2027 or 2028. I don't remember what, what I threw in the chat. A lot of money, like an absorbent amount of money that would go to a guy that has had knee problems and has had to manage them for several seasons. So as it stands right now, vibes could not be worse. Knock on wood. Um, they just well, they, they the play Nuggets. the Wizards. They play the Wizards next Monday. If they don't have a win yeah. by then, then... Uh, if they lose, If they lose that game... Take a peek at that upcoming schedule, fellas. Oh, it's bad. Take a look. You are losing. You're going to. Dude, you have Philly twice. You got Milwaukee. You got the Lakers. Dude, you're the next winnable game you have is Utah. You could be looking if you don't beat the Jazz at the Jazz. If you don't beat the Wizards, you could be looking at a 21 game losing streak. 21 games. It's possible i mean if they don't beat the wizards at home this app will melt twitter is going to melt our podcast is going to melt everything's going to be so bad i i don't even want to think about that but it you can't rule anything out so 
the vibes are poor. Cade called out the team and said, all right, we need to be real. The team is bad. <laughs> Let's just accept that and, and figure out how to do better from here. The offense is bottom five in the league. The defense is bottom eight. I think all oh, by the way, are in the boat of don't. I'm sorry. Go ahead. I was just say, by the way, that league best three point shooting at the for the first eight games or whatever, they're 19th now, and still taking the least amount of threes of any team in the league. So correct. Good luck. Um. So with the locker room sort of, and especially after the Monty Morris thing, I, I don't know what the locker room is like now. <laughs> it's just being all messy. Plus the lack of picks, plus the need to correct this immediately um, or take the patient route. How are we feeling about potential moves? You know, Jaden Ivey being dangled, which I wrote about and said I would not do. Um, as tempting as it is to get a floor raiser immediately, I, I, I don't think you can do that. Definitely not for somebody like Levine. There are players out there where you would move Jaden Ivey in a heartbeat, like Mikhail Bridges, but you wouldn't do that for a Zach Levine. Tim, you get to go first again while Jasper simmers for a little bit longer. <laughs> yeah. Well, Let's talk about trades in the front office. And, you know, maybe maybe we'll talk about culpability later with regards to who gets some blame. But just moves, trades, acquisitions like that that aren't going to be panic moves, ideally. Um, what is your yeah. thought on, you know, the Pistons getting into finding a player to be an immediate floor raiser? Yeah, I, I'll walk it back a little bit. Like the the phrase Blake Griffin trade, uh, for especially us three is gonna is gonna hurt. Um we don't I don't like I was not the one who uh remains extremely fond of that time, but it, it it's at the business back. But um you can't say they weren't fun and I don't think it's the same exact situation where um you're trading for let's just say the business trade for a washed injury prone player. Now, Blake Griffin wasn't that, and he quickly became that. He turned into a pumpkin after a year and a half, much due to playing through injuries because that was the only way the Pistons could sell seats. Um, I think the foundation, and I think you can craft some sort of trade where you're not trading Cade, Asar, Duran, um, and I remain that Ivy is the one that they will dangle. I think even though it's going to hurt, I lean more on the side of, I'd be willing to make a trade. Levine, great offense, great fit. Like, like strictly just, and I'll I'll probably dive deep in this later. But having a guy like Levine who can score at will. I mean, I was six rows away from the highest scoring game in, in the LCA history so far. Uh, Levine's fifty-one on opening night. The like having a player like that might compound for the other players, might compound for Cade, Asar, and Durant. They all be, might be more open, less pressure, easier looks. I think that's that's plausible. But you can't deny bad contract. You said mentioned $49 million in 2027. There is an optimism of how they get to be a team that gets sort of that first-round pick before 2027, where they're going into the tax uh, to, to keep a great team together in 2027. There isn't like an immediate, like apparent path to that. So signing up for a guy like Zach Levine, who you're paying that much later on, who has been injured um, and has never really bar been part of a winning team. I don't love that. I don't love Levine. I like trading. Obviously I, I'm in the chat setting fake trades and players all the time. I, lo I love the trade, but I don't love Levine being the guy on the other end of it. I don't, I don't necessarily hate it just because they need something in my opinion, but he can't be the guy. Uh, I wrote down Brandon Ingram, uh, who is an even better fit, even better contract, still kind of injury prone a little bit, definitely harder to snag. Like the Pelicans would have to say, Zion isn't it. Ingram isn't it. we gave up a bunch for CJ McCollum and this isn't it. And they got to tear it down. And if, if New Orleans tears it down, they have to move like they have to move cities. So they, they, they can't tear it down. They're going to be as bad as they are with the highly paid and extensive roster, um, deep roster and bad for as long as it takes for someone to save them. Uh, otherwise they will move. And then there's other names that have been floated out. Um, uh, like Zion, Zion, no, um, Julius Randall, no, like I will, I will actually stop being a Pistons fan if Julius Randle wears the Pistons red, blue, and black. So, um, 
the those names don't hit for me. The last one I wrote down, who is still like Zach Levine light, a bit overpaid, actual deadly scorer, is Tyler Hero. Um, then again, like I don't like I just I I have not besides like McKilbert, as we mentioned, Ingram is is up there too. But there, there's really right now with the landscape, there aren't star wings available for a good reason. Like Jalen Brown, way overpaid, doesn't have a left hand. Like Killian should give him his left hand because <laughs> he's not using it. So um, I I just can't I can't think right now. Like Mikhail Bridges remains like the apple of my eye. It's not Cam Johnson like we talked about all summer. He's he's injured. Um, I I am searching. I, I literally like, I'm off work this week. I literally was on NBA.com just like looking at every team's roster. And I was like, oh, Laurie Markkinen. Yeah, Laurie yeah, Laurie Markkinen is another one who like um, is really good and would be a great fit. I think the price is going to be expensive. You're dealing with Danny Ainge. And uh, if there's some inklings out there that Tom Gorris is going to want the splashy move, he's surely not going to want to go get Troy Weaver's favorite guy, Jeremy Grant, either, even though he hypothetically would be a decent fit on this team. Still doesn't get us where we want to go. So I, I would be okay with almost any combination of trading Ivy and maybe some salary filler, Wiseman and Harris, or maybe even Wiseman and Bogey for the right player. Maybe someone on this list, maybe someone we're not thinking of, just to make the team better. But I, I just, I understand, I understand the hesitancy from you guys, especially by dealing Ivy, and I understand the hesitancy from the front office if they're going to sit on their hands and like, hey, there really isn't a player out there. But I, I think they need something, and I, I hate to leave this on a bad note, but I just, I can't find it yet, and I hope they can before. I mean, for Troy's sake, he loses his job. Well, will he? I don't know. I mean, tr- truly, like, he probably should have lost his job last night. Probably, like, if Tom Gore should have walked into his office and said, hey, man, I'm sorry, this ain't working. Uh, you've had four years, and this team is worse off than when you took it over. They're on pace to finish with less wins than when he took over. So I, I, I think for me, I mean, I have no faith that Troy Weaver is losing his job. We're talking about... We, we can't properly evaluate this. Is, this is what James, you know, James Edwards, the third wrote today. I can't properly evaluate the roster until Bogdanovich is back. What are you talking about? That What are you talking about? Boyan Bogdanovich. It, look at the teams last year in the NBA finals. Find me the minutes for Boyan Bogdanovich. You think, honestly, you think Bogdanovich would play over Struess <laughs> at this point in their respective careers? Max Struess gives you defense. Look at that Nuggets roster. Who was he going to ever get playing time over on that roster? And you talk about, you know, trades. Well, maybe they can figure out trades. Troy Weaver rejected a trade for Alex Caruso, another player who would have been perfect on this roster, for Derrick Rose because the price was too high. Last year, when Boyan Bogdanovich's trade value was the highest it will ever be for the rest of his career, he asked for two first-round picks, which no one was ever going to pay. Same thing happened for Jeremy Grant. Like we talk about it, it's great that they got Durin from that from from Jeremy Grant, but that was not the trade package that Troy Weaver was looking for. He wanted multiple first rounders. The only reason he even got Bogdanovich in the first place is because Danny Ainge was literally begging people to help him lose games. I guess we did him a favor too, now didn't we? Um, you know, I, I just for me, it's just it's it's absurd, and I have one no faith that they would bring in anybody in the trade market that would actually help because they haven't really. Um, And two, I don't really think that the trade packages you're throwing together, Tim, really just every other team that's in a similar ish position that needs to get better. That's young. That has, you know, that is trying to get another vet on their roster. They all have more to work with. Orlando has more to work with. Utah has more to work with. Um, uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm like now. I'm just not even thinking. But like, the Rockets have more to work with. Dylan Brooks has more trade value right now than probably any player on your roster not named Sarcade, Ivy, or Durin, or maybe Bogdanovich. That's even just hypothetical until he comes back. So, I, I mean, that in and of itself, I think, says a lot about where you're at. Um, Zach Levine, to me, is like he's not even. 
half the player Blake Griffin was. And if that's the kind of guy that you're banking on to save your season, dude, I got bad freaking news. And I got really bad news when he injures his knee, because as I've already outlined, this piston staff can't keep anybody healthy. You think Zach Levine's knees are going to get any better in Detroit? Or do you think that he's probably going to suffer a season ending injury, you know, about 15 games in and then never play, you know, effective basketball ever again? Which one do you think is more likely? Genuinely. And, and like we talk about Brandon Ingram, Lori Markinen, I love those guys. I'd love to have them on my team. Unfortunately, Jaden Ivey and James Wiseman and Boyamba, that is just not going to cut it. When you look at Orlando, who can offload, you know, Jalen Suggs and a first rounder and Jonathan Isaac, like guys with actual upside and picks, you know, people who are under team control. And the fact that we're even talking about trading Ivy, does that not speak into the intense amount of just brutal vibes around? Him. gives him nothing to work with in the second half even though you know the the nuggets front court can't stay ahead of him for the life of them gives him nothing to do um so yeah when i look at this like i have just no faith that a they could pull off a trade like with the assets that they have or b that the player they trade for would be anything other than a dwindling depreciating asset or c that that player could even turn around this season into being anything more than 22 wins. And where are you next year? You're back in the same place you were with another top five pick and another vet that you're, you're, you know, hoping you can offload before they lose all their trade value. I, I, I just, I get what you're saying, Tim, but I just don't see how that is a solution when your overall roster is so broken from top to bottom just doesn't make any sense. Yeah. Don't you think that Troy Weaver made that, that Isaiah Stewart trade strictly because he loves drafting so much. Like he, he loves drafting. He loves drafting. So when you, when you bring up the fact that he was asking for two first round picks for Boyan Bogdanovich, which all of us know, like that'd be incredible, but he's not worth that. He just wanted to draft. He just wants to draft. Like the episode of I think you should. The episode he keeps I think on you trading leave. a while. These second rounders. He wants to draft first rounders. You know how? And I think you should leave. Which I did watch, by the way. Where um the the guy the he's playing a character who just he's at like a bachelor type show and he keeps going down the zip line. All he wants to do is just go down the zip line. That's Troy Weaver with first round picks. All he just wants first round picks. He wants to make first round picks. And if you do something that that had that hinders his ability to make first round picks. He just gets gets upset. So no, and- no, I swear, I really, really want to win basketball games. <laughs> I really want to win them. <laughs> no, no, I don't want to just keep drafting at the top five every year. Yeah, uh, it's incredible. And people think he's. There's still some people out there who go, "Well, you got to give him credit for his drafting." Oh wow, really? Do you? <laughs> Oh, you took Kate Cunningham first overall? Gee whiz, what a genius. Who else could have done that? I could have done that. In fact, I I literally wanted Jaden Ivey, uh, uh, Kate Cunningham, and Asar Thompson. So yeah. what do and I Durin, get? Should I be DM? Duran would have been nice. And just... I'll tell you this much. I wouldn't have drafted Dervidas Servitas in Balsa Kopravica in the second round. So, <laughs> I, I mean, this guy is just a... <laughs> It's it's absurd. I don't know what broke me about this game so much. I just it the fact that you could not beat the Bucks without Giannis and now could not beat the Nuggets in a game where their head coach and their star player both went, look, these guys need it more than we do. <laughs> we're gonna we're gonna leave. And and let's also not forget, look, the refs, I'll say this, the refs do the Pistons no favors. However, last night. Let's be real, fellas. Adam Silver sent a little email before the game and said, hey, look, guys, we Detroit needs a win here, okay? We're in tinfoil territory. No, I really. I mean, like, look at some of the foul calls Cade got last night. He never gets those calls. And, I you know, Vegas making the call. I mean, how many people would have bet Nuggets by a million, you know? And I got to go, go back and, and finish my uh, I think you should leave point here. You, there's the end of the the skit ends with the the woman saying, "It 
it just really it just really seems like you you you're only here for the zip line. Well, I think Troy, you're you're really only here for drafting. You're really only here to draft in the top five. And when you couldn't draft in the top five, you or when you couldn't draft in the top four, you had to argue about which coach you wanted. So like the there you're right about the the Nuggets game, particularly like the NBA, and I feel like we're gonna see this again. Like they're gonna either Vegas or the NBA or the powers above are gonna swoop in and try to give the Pistons another one. Hopefully, it's Friday against the Pacers. Hopefully, it's Monday against the Wizards. It it's gotta be it's it's gotta be one of these games. And I just we're, I'm left I'm left speechless as Jasper. I'm left as speechless as Jasper is. Um, just, just steaming and i know it's not the best thing to, to be speechless on a podcast so i'm trying to give you some air here <laughs> no i mean mike i feel like you should take it because i just like that that game last night everything on the table for you and you not only could you not pull it off you lost in the same way that you've continued to lose games the whole time troy weaver has been gm the whole time. And I, I mean, there's, I think there's even more to get into. It's like, where does the blame fall at a certain point? Is it, is it all? I don't think you can just blame Troy. I don't think you can just blame Monty. I, I, I think Tom Gorris has to be the guy because like you said, Tim, Monty, you know, like Troy Weaver and Tom Gorris argued over who was going to, you know, be the head coach. And instead of trusting Troy Weaver to, to take, to hire the guy he wanted, Tom Gorris said, no, I'm going to go out there and I'm going to prove that I'm the smartest guy in the room by swinging my you know what around and giving Monty Williams the largest contract in head coaching history up until that point, even though he didn't want to coach. He didn't want to coach. And you see it now. And so it's like, who even gets the blame for that? Is it Troy Weaver for throwing out garbage head coaching candidates because he wants to be the smartest guy in the room? Is it Tom Gorris because he has a little man complex? You know, as you saw when he stupped his sister-in-law, that guy just can't freaking help himself. He's like a total slave to his wildest, in his, you know, desires. Or is it Monty Williams who accepted the freaking deal in the first place, even though he doesn't like Jaden Ivey and didn't want to coach this year? Whose fault is it? Is it one of them or is it really everybody? Is it the organization as a whole? I think I know my answer. I think I know your answer too. And I'm uh, there's there's a lot of blame that can be passed around. You talked about the injuries. We've talked about Troy Weaver. Jasper, you and I have talked about Troy Weaver being bad so long that the YouTube comments have actually come around to agreeing with us. We've been doing this shtick for like 15 months now of like Troy Weaver's making bad decisions. What is he doing to now people agreeing with us saying, you're right. He is making bad decisions. Um, blame goes around. I didn't want to agree with the Monty Williams took a gigantic paycheck and is now just kind of hamming it up. But I, and I still don't really think that, but I mean, I don't think any of us anticipated, even with these injuries and with the growth of the young guys, I don't think it, I, I don't think any of us could have expected to be two and 13 with a 12 game losing streak to start off the year. I don't, I mean, I know that a coach doesn't make all the difference and the players have to play, but I don't think any of us expected to be in the position that we're in right now. Um, but I think to put a bow on our panic trade topic, all of us are in agreement of, yeah, there's no way you can trade Ivy and stuff for Zach Levine. There's, there's just no way. You're not him. You're putting your, I just not, right. it can't, it can't be him. Yeah. It and I, and Zach I just Levine. don't see, I just don't see who else like Ivy, who else is a difference maker that like Ivy and stuff can get you. I just, I don't see a trade package there. Like it'd have to be Ivy and Asar or Ivy and Jalen Duran for, for Asar. And you can't do that because then you're back to where you were with no young assets and an aging star on your roster. And so it's just like, they are in, they are in really dire straits right now. 
Like the only defense I've actually seen anybody give me for the job that's been done here is, well, these guys are expiring. And it's just like, that's it. You have a lot of, ex that's your excuse in year four expire. That is year one stuff. That's the stuff you do when you blow it. The year you blow it up, right. you trade for expiring deals. So if that's where you're at right now, oh my God, this thing has just gone completely off the rails. I think of the Homer Simpson meme where it's like, you know, last night was the worst game of the season. No, it was the worst game of the season so far. And that's where it feels like <laughs> we're at. Like, I don't, I don't even know if we've hit rock bottom. I think that Monty Morris tweet, that was in a way showing where this season is headed. We're where now, yep, where now you start getting locker room stuff and people start, you know, uh, uh, losing faith in the coach and the organization and all that stuff that is, you know, that is the pretty much the only negative that they've avoided over the last three years. But now you're seeing it and it's the dysfunction is growing and growing and not even the tight lock that these guys have on the beat reporters can stop it because the players are starting to, to say stuff too. I think Cade's, Cade's comments the other night were very telling. I hope Very that telling. we don't look back and on those the body language in a few years. I hope we don't look back on those comments in a, in like a year or two and be like, oh, well, that was the moment where it really started to un unravel for him wanting to be part of this organization. Just a sh just a vote of no confidence moving forward with Troy's ability to put winning players around him and and put him in a good environment to win basketball games. But that was, I'll be honest telling i'm genuinely fearful he could be the first player to turn down that a, a max extension the rookie max i'm i'm genuinely feel fearful of that oh wow what a gut punch that would be but truly i mean he's a he's a competitor you you look at Cade and the way he plays and the way his body language everything since he was in high school the dude is a winner like the guy just wants to win. He wants to play. He wants to play competitive basketball. He wants to play with guys to make them better. He wants to be better. And you look at it, the extension, it's this off season. If they're going to extend him, it's this off season. Really, honestly, if I'm Kate Cunningham, other than pure avarice, why would I take that? The organization is worse off now than they were when they drafted you. Why would you take that deal if you really want to win? And I don't know if we're at that point yet, but if you're getting to 21 game losing streaks, if you're competing with the Charlotte Hornets for the worst record in the history of the NBA, what's really your impetus for staying? Yeah, I know. I know. And him grabbing expirings, him being Troy, grabbing expirings to kick that cap space can down the river a little bit longer, or down the road, rather, a little bit longer, to open up space to sign who exactly next year? I mean, I've got maybe the they list. can get it's, Sadiq Bay. Yeah. I've got the list here, too. Oh. It, you got Tobias Harris, old friend of the program. You got... Um... James Harden, he'd be a great Detroit fit. Uh, he'd probably like uh, he'd probably like Sweetwaters. Um, uh, Pascal Siakam, uh, eh, it's okay. Never know? in a million years is he signing in Detroit. Not in a uh, million years. Um, Demar Derozan. Uh, you know who Play. one of the highest paid players? Oh, um, that's they should they should trade for Levine and then sign Derozan in the off season. That'd be a good backcourt. Oh. yep, yep. Uh, there's always another big body center like Jonas Valanciunas. Um, and it really, it really drops it. Like Pistons are going to throw a bag at Gary Trent Jr. An old friend of the program, Kelly Olenek. They could retain Joe Harris, Alec Burks, Monty Morris. Oh, maybe the could Kyle Anderson, slow-mo. He could uh, genuinely, he'd be the best wing on the roster right now. A dysfunctional franchise like the Pistons would have no problem welcoming in uh, formerly interested in Miles Bridges. Um, so there's there's a lot there's a lot of options for the Pistons to really make this team very similar to what it is now by using their cap space. Now that Thank opens you. up that just reopens the trade conversation if we're being serious, and we've already done that a thousand times at this point. 
and I'm just very curious to see where it's going to go. They could pay KCP. Oh, that'd Finally. be destiny. Destiny fulfilled. <laughs> yeah. No, one, I mean, one last, look. Ooh. Well, the last player that I think could make a return, Corey Joseph. <laughs> oh, God. What's Steve Blake up to? Ooh, Aaron would stop doing the podcast if they brought <laughs> Steve Blake back. <laughs> oh, in, holy in crap. Any, in any fashion. Maybe they can for- bring in Jameer Nelson's son to, to, to play minutes for him. That's messed up. Tim Fork and yeah. All-Star Dylan Windler is available. Uh, oh, I'm sure yes. I'm sure our uh I'm sure our injury and medical staff will do a great job with yeah. Dylan Windler. Yeah. No, but I mean Tim, you're 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 putting it out there like perfectly right now. Okay, they have expiring deals. They have flexibility. For what? For what? Right. You don't have a you don't have a first round pick to work with. Basically, how it works is if you trade a first round pick, you actually have to give up two first round picks because you have to let that next pick convey, and then you can move another pick, not the year after, uh, you know. And you're also still probably going to have to trade a player as well. Who do you have that's an asset? It's only young guys. It's only young guys right now. Um, I mean, genuinely, right now I'm looking at it the. Their best asset that's like actually healthy for them right now and isn't, you know, 22 years old is probably Marvin Bagley. Am I wrong? Yeah, Mike, I'm good if you're good now. <laughs> that's how we end. <laughs> it's probably Marvin Bagley. <laughs> I think that's, that's where one. we're at, gentlemen. Show. <laughs> that's where we're at. So. Hey, enjoy that cap space. It's going to be great. I can't wait till we trade for some other 57-year-old geriatric who, uh, you know, spends more time in, a, in an ice bath than he does on the court. Uh, dude, you know, okay, here's, here's my last little thing. Here we go. So um, the Pistons have a combined $62 million of their $137 million and a half payroll locked up in Bogdanovich, Harris, James Wiseman, and Monty Morris. Those four guys have combined for 188 out of a possible 2,880 minutes this year. That is 6.5% of their total possible combined playing time for 45% of your entire payroll. That's where we're at. And again, which one of those guys can you offload for anything? For anything? Maybe Bogdanovich. And that is still only a hypothetical because he's not on the court yet. We thought Monty Morris was going to be back this week. Now he's out for another eight. Yeah. Where is the where is the room to get better? I I genuinely, unless you are able to make a free agent signing this offseason that completely shocks everyone in the world, I I don't see it. I genuinely don't see it. Well, let's yep. let's end on you know at least a positive, as positive as positive as we can get tone. I mean. When you're talking about best case scenarios, or at least realistic, good scenarios to round out the season, I mean, them getting healthy before the All Star break, before the trading deadline, and being able to have these guys on the court and produce, whether that leads to wins or not, is is your best avenue to getting out of that hole that you've been talking about of where do we get better? Bogdanovich producing, showing he's healthy, playing well, and being able to offload him to get something. You're not going to get two firsts. You weren't going to get two firsts last year when he was having a career year. But offloading him and being able to get something back, that's how you start to worm your way out. I don't know what you're going to do about Morris at this point. I mean, the fact he can't, he's not going to be on the court till January does not bode well for being able to get anything of substance. And you're just going to kind of be stuck. I mean, Joe Harris is going to be a nothing. We didn't get an injury update on him, but I think he had a two-week AC sprain. What does it matter? I think well, Stanley Amude yeah. is a two-way type of player, and he's vastly outplayed Joe Harris this year. Oh, not even close. For sure. He has, so. absolutely. 
But I think the hope is that you get a couple of these guys healthy and you're able to offload them for anything as opposed to right now, which is barely anything and start to work your way out of that glut there. But I, I agree. It's tough to find a way out that is clean. It's not going to be clean. You're going to might, you, you might have to attach something to something to get your way out. And they just don't have the ability to do that right now. Yeah. I, I, we, we were talking about like the things we're grateful for. I'm already thinking like towards Christmas, like what, what would I want as a Pistons fan? Because obviously wins, you know, number one, as we're talking about this whole podcast is like, what's the way they go get a win. We're, we're looking for one win here. First of all, one. let me be clear. Like one win. Um, we're at Jim Mora levels. Yeah. The, the, I know that I, I'm not like, a, I'm not one of the three Pistons regulars on the podcast. So I'll, I'll, I'll finish with this. Like the other thing that I would want for a Christmas gift uh, coincides with the smartest thing I've ever heard Jasper say. And Jasper says a lot of smart things on this podcast, but the smartest thing that Jasper ever said, I think about the Pistons was that Cade Cunningham was supposed to be six, eight. And the gift that we got was six, six. So for Christmas and for Thanksgiving, I would like Cade Cunningham to grow two more inches just as Sengun has. And I would like him to be the superstar guard that we all want him to be. Um, that we like felt like we were, we're close and dancing around a solution for how the Pistons are going to get a win and how, like how we get out of this and the trades and stuff. We, we, we searched and we, we looked around and we, we ripped, ripped the organization. We went through everything and we're still left not knowing. But if I do know one thing, and I'll close it out here, I am grateful to have been on the podcast with you boys today. Uh, we're happy to have you too, Tim. Truly, I was I was all fired up for when Michael's like, "Yeah, Tim can do the podcast." I was like, "Hell yeah, let's fuck, let's freaking go." Is what I meant go, to dude. say there. Let's, let's fork, fork and go. go. <laughs> let's fork and go. Oh my god. Yeah. No, that's pretty much it. Hey, I'm happy that I at least have somewhere to vent my frustrations. Uh, and somehow people still listen to me. So that's also really nice as well. And I'm very grateful to have Mike and Aaron and Tim tonight uh, to actually have me from completely like having a brain aneurysm when I do when we do these podcasts because you guys are the only thing keeping me back the only thing keeping me back sometimes I'm like just in the club like somebody stepped on my shoes I I need you guys there to stop me from pretending to want to fight somebody so mm -hmm. thank you for that I really do appreciate it yeah I mean, um half of our group are already Pacers fans so like Palace of Pacers <laughs> could be coming your way next season if we don't <laughs> figure this out <laughs> Oh my god. Yeah, if the if Indiana sweeps the series, like they get <laughs> knows there isn't gonna be stakes attached to many other business seasons game uh regular season games this year. Uh remember when Troy Weaver said they wanted to play 82 games of competitive basketball? I think I think we're like I think they've played about four games of competitive basketball so far. <laughs> <laughs> and therefore the rest are not meaningful either yeah well hopefully one of these days they can play a meaningful game against a team that isn't fielding you know four nba players and a g league squad um or isn't sitting you know two of their three best players uh or or isn't having you know the best player in the league get get kicked out of the game uh i don't know man just washington jordan pool I have one request. Don't stop shooting. Just keep shooting, buddy. He won't. Please. He's a Michigan man. He's got to want to see us get one. <laughs> like, please. <laughs> your team's your team is not doing as bad. Like, your guys are doing bad. But, like, do one for, solid for the mitten, Jordan. Please. I'm begging you. <laughs> if I come to Detroit and both Mitchell and Garland are resting again for the second year in a row, I'll be very upset. That's now oh, the new bar is to just not let opposing teams rest their stars against the Pistons. Yeah, well, okay, hold Max Struess to, you know, something less than like 15, 17 points whenever he wants them. And then maybe I thought you were going to say 70 because it's still kind of realistic. <laughs> uh, yeah, <laughs> sure. <laughs> if Bogdanovich is back by then, yeah, he might. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's not that's the thing too, like with the Bogdanovich stuff. And we got to wrap. We do.
coming back from an eight month injury. Like I'm sure he's tip top shape. So yeah, gentlemen, it's um I don't know. I'm sorry for coming on here and being all doom and gloom, but last night's game was one of the most like devastating losses I've experienced as a Pistons fan in a long time. Just not because of the loss itself, but because of what it implies for this roster and this team and the future moving forward. It it's yeah. it's bad. I just don't have any other way to say it. Like getting blown out by the Nuggets with Jokic would have genuinely had me in a better place than th that close loss without him. Right. It, it really would have. Um, because now I'm just like, who who can you beat? Who can you beat? I don't I don't know. Well, hopefully the next time we have a podcast, the Pistons will have beaten somebody, and we could talk about that win instead of this crippling intervention that has just occurred for the last hour. <laughs> um, they could really use a win, and we could really use a win to talk about too. Tim, I want to thank you for joining us on the pod. Of course, great man. to have you on. Um, we'll we will do this again. Um, Jasper, thank you as always for filling up a, enough of the airtime that um, I don't have to do as much talking. <laughs> as long as I can That's like, a, that steer is, you, then I'm good. That is the nicest way anybody's told me to shut up I've ever heard. Th thank you so much <laughs> for that, Mike. That was that was so kind. No, I in the words just... of Tim. No, what were you saying? I'm just let Jasper cook, man. That's why you're here. I, hey, I, I let him cook. I'm all for it. You you let me fork and go. So I, it's time to chain myself back up uh, and get myself right for Thanksgiving at my girlfriend's house. Because I don't go. think her grandma is going to appreciate what I have to say about the Pistons. <laughs> yeah, we're going to need a rundown of her uh, opinion on the Pistons uh for our next podcast uh, she's an uh, Arge, she's from argentina so I'll, i'm sure she has oh, a lot of okay. words to say i'm andre nocioni <laughs> nice <laughs> that's awesome <laughs> uh okay well we'll be looking forward to that update and we'll hopefully be looking forward to talking about a pistons win next week on the pod and we hope that you'll be joining us for the next edition of the palace pistons podcast i want to thank our sponsor for this week that is bet online. If you use our promo code believe B L E A V, you get a fifty percent welcome bonus on your first deposit when you use bet online. For my co-host Jasper Bologna and our special guest Tim Forkin, I am Mike Angolano. Thank you so much for joining us on this edition of the Palace of Pistons podcast, part of the Believe Network, and we will see you all next time.